Hello, I'm Dave Capillary from Purdue University. And today I'm going to present to you some work that my colleagues and I have done on a tumbling magnetic microrobot system for biomedical applications. So, microrobotics is a study of robotics automation used to manipulate small scale objects on the micro scale. Now, when the robot itself is at the micro scale and it's untethered or has wireless control, we consider that as a mobile micro robot. And so you can see some examples of some mobile micro robots we developed here at Purdue. And, and so for your reference, the human hair is about the size of 100 microns in diameter. So these robots you see here are about eight human hairs wide by seven human hairs high. And you might try to figure out how, how can you power something that's this small, right? It's too small to mount a battery to it. So what do you do? But people typically use some kind of external field in order to control the robots. And the mo most popular field that is used by far is, is magnetic fields. So as long as the robot has some kind of magnetic property, you can use a, an external magnetic field in order to control it in the workspace. And we've developed a couple of different types of magnetic micro robots over the years. Um, here, uh, so there's examples of two of those. So this is a soft magnetic micro robot. And so what that means is that it uses soft magnetic materials uh, which are not magnetic unless there is in the presence of a magnetic field. So if the magnetic field turns on, then they have magnetic properties. And then the polarity of the, of the robot aligns with its major axis of the body. In contrast to that, if you have a hard magnetic micro robot, it uses permanent magnetic bodies or, or permanent magnets inside it. So it has a fixed polarity at all times and it's magnetic at all times, independent of when there's a field or not. And so in this case, we did, we, what we did was we mixed the magnetic particles inside uh, this photoresist we, when we fabricated the robot, and then we just aligned those uh, poles during the fabrication setup. Uh, so in order to test these robots, we, we used this, uh, we developed uh, electromagnetic coil system. So there's just some uh, coils that we use to surround the workspace and we can turn current on in different values in order to control the magnetic field. Um, and so the first uh, example here is showing a soft magnetic body on a, on a silicon wafer on a dry surface. Uh, so here the dry surface has very high uh, friction and, and static friction that needs to be broken in order for the robot to move. So we, as a consequence, need to have very high currents going through electromagnetic coils in order to break that surface friction. But then the robot ends up moving around quite fast and uncontrolled. Uh, so what we can do to alleviate that is we, we can actually operate the robot in a liquid medium, in this case, some uh, mineral oil, uh, it reduces the friction uh, quite a bit and we get nice smooth control of the movement for the robot as you see it moving around here in this little maze. Uh, so once we have that, that control in the, in, the, in the wet environment, we're able to actually use the robot to do some, some manipulation tasks. And you can see an example of that here down below as this, this one robot is just moving this little triangular piece down this one millimeter channel. But our eventual goal for these robots is, is something like this. Out in the future, we'd love to have a, a robot which we can use to do uh, microsurgical tasks like this. It's around the size of a red blood cell. It has onboard processors, actuators, cameras, uh, kind of really futuristic vision. So we're not there yet, but what can we do kind of in the short term to help us move toward that direction? Well, our idea was, can we come up with a micro robot we, we can use for target drug delivery or diagnostic applications? And rather than trying to tackle the problem of uh, having robots inside the, the, blood, the blood flow of the body, we can target some areas like the peritoneal cavity or the colon uh, in the body where we don't have to withstand that blood flow. And these, so these types of environments are characterized by wet, sticky surfaces and, and very complex geometry. And so if you take one of our uh, magnetic micro robots which I showed you before, which uses those gradient fields. If we want to control this robot in the body and pull it with a gradient, it's gonna get stuck in the sticky, wet, complex environment. So what can we do instead? Well, we can kind of get inspiration from, what, uh, from uh, you think of your car, when we go off road and try to go over this rough terrain, we put these big tires on, on the car so we can roll over this rough terrain. Uh, so we take the same approach here. What we can do then is, is use uh, a rotating magnetic field. And now we can design our robot to align its poles with this magnet. So then as this, this field rotates, the robot will also rotate and tumble or roll over that rough terrain. 
that we can get it to our target location and administer the drug or, or take some samples for diagnostic applications. And so that's the idea behind this uh, microscale tumbling manic micro robot, which you see here. Uh, so this robot is about 400 uh, microns wide, 800 microns long. Um, and when we fabricate it, uh, we can uh, put magnetic properties into the robot and we can align them in different ways, uh, as you can see here. So they'll respond to either a uh, rotating magnetic field to rotate either lengthwise tumbling or sideways tumbling. Uh, and so we make this a couple of different ways. We have two versions. We have a segmented version, which actually has three components. It has two uh, magnetic bodies on either end, and then we have a non-magnetic section in the middle. And so this is just a standard two-step photolithography process. Uh, and once the robot actually is fabricated with magnetic particles doped into those, uh, the ends of it, we need to align those magnetic particles. And so what we do then is as the wafer is curing, we put a big magnet next to it. And then we can put it on the top uh, if we want to get a sidewise tumbling robot, or we can put it to the side if we want to get a lengthwise tumbling uh, robot. Another way we can make this is we have a monolithic design. So it is, it is just one uh, piece of um, material. And it is, again, it is the photoresist with dope magnetic particles. And then we align all those uh, particles uh, in one direction. And in this case, we're actually using a, a different machine that we have uh, access to. Uh, it's a very a high powered, it can let out a very high power magnetic field, a nine Tesla field in order to align the particles. Uh, and so we can do that um, either way to get either a sideways tumbling or a lengthwise tumbling. And our resultant magnetization is about almost five times as, as large as it was in the case when we had a magnet um, during the soft bake uh, process. Uh, so here you can see some examples of, of the robot tumbling both sideways and, and lengthwise and the side view and the top view. Uh, we've also explored a couple of different geometries for the ends of the robot. Uh, we looked at a rounded, rounded ends, uh, asymmetric ends, um, rounded corners, and also the triangular features. Um, and the symmetric rounded ends seem to work the best. We can control the robot to move you know, in, in horizontal lines, uh, vertical lines. We can actually control the trajectory here. We're actually modulating the field in, in the plane as well to get us to do this P trajectory for P for Purdue. Um, and also we were able to actually have the robot locomote in various types of uh, environments with different friction coefficients. So in water and silicon oil, and also on dry surfaces. Uh, and here we're, we're showing how the robot can uh, go down these different terrains. It was going down a 90 degree cliff here and it's able to uh, continue on its way. We also looked at it, its ability to climb up different inclines. So we're looking at 45 degree inclines in a dry environment also 60 degree inclines, um, and then also 60 degree inclines with water. So it, it can negotiate 45 fine in dry environments, has some issues with 60, but if we put it in a little bit of fluid, uh, which reduces some of the friction, it's able to um, get up a 60 degree incline very well. And you can see that in a little close up here of how the robot is able to uh, grip the surface and climb up this very steep incline. Uh, we also looked at it here uh, in different types of, of surfaces. Um, bumpy surfaces, a knurled surface, a honeycomb surface, and also ones with different bumps. And so these results seem promising. And, and so we'll see, okay. once we have this robot that works, it's kind of this all-terrain micro robot, can we actually use it for biomedical applications? Uh, so the first thing we need to do is figure out, is it biocompatible? So we want to look at some cytotoxicity tests uh, for the robot. So the robot is made uh, out of SU8 resist and magnetic particles. We also have variants of the robot made out of PDMS, which is a soft polymer, also with the same particles. And so what we did was we, we had a positive and negative control um, of, of cells, and then we ex exposed it to um, SU8 material and tried to grow the cells on the SU8 material by itself. And we also tried to grow the cells on the SU8 material with the particles in it. And then we had and we looked at how many cells would remain over different time periods. So at day zero, day one, and day three. And so green means that there are cells there. So you can see after uh, three days, um, the cells are still, still alive, uh, which, which is what we hope to expect. Uh, so in the negative control, you can see the cells remain. In the positive control, there should not be any cells. And we got some results when we looked at the PDMS as well. So that says, okay, our robots are not cytotoxic, and so they are biocompatible for use in the body. 
Next, we wanted to see if we could actually uh, deliver a drug uh, from the robot. So can we actually load a drug to the robot and then diffuse it off, off of the robot? Uh, and so what we did was we coated the robot uh, using a solution of DFM, chloroform, and PLGA and a, flu and a fluorescent um, dye. Um, and then we put those into uh, a PBS uh, buffered solution. And so here you can see a, an image of, of what the robot looks like uh, before we put it into the solution. So this is the electrospraying spraying of, those, of, of that material. And then what we can do then is observe the, uh, amount, the intensity of the fluorescent uh, marker as it dissolves or diffuses off of the robot over time. And so by monitoring that intensity, we're able to figure out what percentage of that mock drug payload is actually being delivered or diffused out. So after one hour, almost 50% of the, of the drug, mock drug has been released. So we can, act, so we can load the robot with, with, with a payload and we can diffuse it, uh, diffuse it off of the robot. Okay, next is we wanted to see if we can actually do some in vivo imaging of the robot and also locomotion. So in order to, uh, to control the robot in, inside an animal, an animal model that we wanted to use, we had to come up with a new uh, type of test apparatus. So here we're using a, a, a rotating magnet, permanent magnet, um, and underneath an ultrasound a transducer probe to do the in vivo imaging. Uh, so what we can do is we can rotate the magnet here uh, to get the, the robot uh, to rotate at different frequencies along inside in the workspace. We also have another uh, actuator here where we can actually use it to rotate the whole, the whole magnet underneath it to actually get the steering done. So we have two degrees of freedom, two degrees of freedom of control here, along with the ultrasound imaging system for real-time imaging. Okay, so first what we did was we did some ex vivo tests inside a pig colon. And here we wanted to explore um, di four different types of robots. So we looked at SU8 robots rotating lengthwise and also estimate robots rotating uh, sideways and we looked at them in water at uh, half a hertz one hertz and one and a half hertz so we're showing the one hertz uh, tests here so you see we're able to see the robots quite well using the ultrasound system and now this is the same thing using robots made out of pdms rotating both lengthwise and lengthways and sideways again we're able to image both of these uh, quite well on the uh, using the, and the ultrasound imaging. And then this last test is actually showing how we can actually control more than one robot in the workspace uh, at the same time. And so you'll see uh, two of these robots actually rotating uh, sideways uh, through, the, through the colon, uh, the dissected colon of, of, uh, of a pig. Uh, so what we, we did some velocity analysis uh, to try to understand these results. And so we, so we compared uh, the different the different uh, types of robots and at different frequencies. And what we learned here was that lengthwise tumbling is faster than sideways tumbling. And so that is an advantage. We want to, the robots to move there faster. Um, the SO8 micro robots also were faster than the PDMS micro robots. And the SO8 robots were actually easier to fabricate than the PDMS ones. So moving forward with our tests, we decided to focus on the SO8 robots with uh, lengthwise tumbling. And so now we want to move to another series of tests and we want it, which were shown here. So now we're looking at uh, first, um, we, we did an agarose block with about a three, milli three uh, millimeter diameter tube. And it's just to see if we could uh, control the robot in this little smaller uh, workspace closer to the actual dimensions of the colon of a mouse, which is our goal. Once that worked, we went into some tests with a, a dissected mouse colon. Uh, so we had this outside of, out, dissected out and was able to control the robot and move up and down the colon, again, using the ultrasound imaging. Uh, so next we move to an intact uh, mouse colon. So here, since, since the colon was still inside the mouse and the mouse was not alive, we had, had to add some Tylus solution or a gel in order to keep the, keep the colon open. This is a kind of a viscous material uh, a solution. So the robot moved a lot slower moving in that solution. And then finally, we did some in vivo tests uh, of a mouse. So now since the mouse is alive, we don't need to add that extra gel substance to keep the colon open. It's also it's open by itself. And you can see that pulsing is actually the mouse breathing as, uh, as the robot is moving back and forth. And so if we look at these results, again, for the velocities, um, 
we can, we can see the, the profiles here. Um, so it actually moves the, moves the fastest in, in water in vitro, um, but they're in, in the slowest when we had a higher viscous material here. Um, and so they, these seem to make, make sense. So if you look at the, the velocities uh, versus these materials versus the viscosity, you can see the, the lowest viscosity material, which happens to be the water in the solution, uh, is, is where we get the fastest uh, response. Uh, so, so that was very promising. Uh, the last thing we wanted to check was how much forces are these robots actually applying uh, to these tissues to see if they're going to damage it. So first we did uh, calculate a theoretical maximum force um, that the robot, the telling robot could exert as about 44 micronewtons. And so we set up an experiment where we had a force sensor in the workspace and we tried to rotate the robot into the force sensor and record those values. So we did it both statically and dynamically. So for these static tests, we had the robot just on a horizontal surface and would turn the field on. And so it would then rotate up and, and touch the force sensor. For dynamic tests, we actually had the robot uh, get a couple of rotations before it would bump into the sensor. And so if we look at the results here, uh, so for our static forces, um, we're again, low micronewton level around, around five to 10. Although we did have a couple larger values here, which is closer to our theoretical maximum. And then for the dynamic tests, we, we, we looked at uh, one hertz and one and a half hertz um, frequencies. And again, we had uh, kind of middle of the range five or so micronewtons with a couple larger ones at around uh, 10 to 13. And so it might look like a lot of variation, but we can explain that. So a couple of different ways. So first, if we don't have a very direct hit from the, from the robot to the force sensor, right? So maybe it's actually too close. It's not hitting right at the, at the top of the robot. Um, it's going to have a, a lower value. Also, align, it's very hard to align these things in, in, uh, at a very small dimension. So the robot is misaligned. If you look, look at like an offset uh, from the top view, it's not going to have a very flush hit on the force sensor. Similarly, it could also be at an offset angle. And so it may not have um, the ideal maximum value. However, if you look in the literature and, and figure out, you know, what are the typical puncture forces for animal tissue, the ranges are about 0.2 to 2 newtons. And so we are at micronewton level. So we're still a couple orders of magnitude below that. So it is actually very safe uh, for, for these animal tissues. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we developed a micro robot system capable of real-time manipulation and imaging in a variety of environments in vitro and in, in situ, ex vivo, and in vivo. Um, the robots are shown to be viable to cells when compared to the negative control, and they exert forces within, within a safe range, within very safe ranges. Um, finally, we, we had a mock fluorescent, uh, fluorescent payload that we demonstrated we're able to load to the robot and then uh, diffuse off. We did these locomotion tests primarily in the colon, but the system can be used for other types of in view of biomedical applications in other areas of the body as well. Um, and so in the future, we, what we want to do is, you know, move from a mock drug payload to actual real drug payload with some kind of time release. We'd like to make some modifications to the robot so we can actually make on-demand on drug release. I also just want to explore some diagnostic capabilities of the robots and explore other uh, types of similar organs, such as the stomach or intestines or even the brain. Uh, and so finally, I'd just like to acknowledge the uh, the research grants which uh, support this work from NSF and, and NIH, and also acknowledge the facilities at the Burke Now Technology Center, uh, which we use to actually fabricate the robots. <laughs>